Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 19, How Web Browsing Works. In this lesson, I'll show you a few illustrations that depict the way that your computer interacts with the web. This information will be useful background information in later lessons when we discuss tips for safely browsing the web. Some of you may be watching this video as part of a course that uses this textbook. If you are, you should know that the illustrations we're going to examine here are all in Chapter 7. If you aren't using this textbook, then don't worry about it. Just follow along with the lesson. Let's take a look at the first illustration. It depicts some of the primary ways that your computer interacts with the web. Let's start over on the left side of the illustration. This largest box represents your whole computer. In your computer, there's an application called a web browser that allows you to interact with the web. Popular web browsers include Firefox, Chrome, Safari, and Internet Explorer, but there's other options out there as well. One of the primary functions of a web browser is to request and display web pages for the user. That function is represented by the green box that says HTML Viewer. What is HTML exactly? HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and it's the primary code used for writing web pages. We'll look at HTML a little more closely later in this lesson. For now, all you have to see is that web browsers translate web pages from HTML code into graphical displays that we can see on our computer monitors. Web browsers contain many other functions besides simple HTML display capabilities. Your browser probably has a PDF viewer so that it can display PDF files. It may also have a Flash plugin, which allows it to view a variety of online animations written in Flash. Browsers have many more applications like this that allow them to take advantage of the diverse capabilities of the web. In this illustration, these applications are all lumped together into the green box labeled Internal Executables. Your web browser is also linked to other applications on your computer, not just internal applications on the web browser. For example, your web browser might detect a song or a video that's embedded in a web page, and so it might automatically access a media player from your computer so that it can view that media on the web. Your web browser also has access to a couple different kinds of data storage. One kind of data storage is called a cache. Cache helps a web browser to load web pages more quickly. When a web browser loads a web page for the first time, it has to download all of the data from the web server so that it can display it for the user. Web browsers will keep some of this data in cache storage so that the next time the user needs to access the web page, it will load more quickly. It already has some of the data in storage. Another kind of storage is the general file storage for your computer, such as the storage space available on your hard drive. Your web browser can download documents and applications from the web, and it can store those documents and applications in the storage space on your computer. And then you can open or execute those files later without being connected to the internet or even having your web browser open. Now let's start working our way over to the right. There's a red arrow connecting the web browser to the web server. This arrow is labeled HTTP. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. HTTP is the communications protocol, that is the communications rules used for communicating HTML code. Now, you may remember, in an earlier lesson I said that computers communicate across the internet using a set of rules called Internet Protocol, or IP. Now, you might be wondering, well, which is it, IP or HTTP? Technically, the answer is that computers need to use both IP and HTTP in order to access web pages. IP is necessary for communicating anything at all across the internet, whether it be a web page or something else. But HTTP is an additional protocol that's only necessary to communicate web pages. As you can see in the illustration, the HTTP arrow runs both ways. HTTP defines the rules for your web browser to communicate with the web servers, and it also defines the rules for the web servers to communicate back with your web browser. Moving further to the right, this diagram includes a web server. The web server is a storage computer that's located somewhere else on the internet. It's a remote computer containing a document called a web page, and your web browser is the application that allows you to access the web page from your computer. In this illustration, it kind of looks like your computer has a direct connection to the web server, but remember that that's not really the case. 
between your computer and the web server is the whole internet, a vast system of networking devices. The web server contains web pages, and web pages contain two different kinds of content, static content and dynamic content. What's the difference between static content and dynamic content? The main difference between the two is how interactive they are. Static content is less interactive. It stays the same every time you access it, regardless of what you do with it. Text and photos are examples of static content. Text and photos are often meant to stay the same for every user who accesses them. Dynamic content, on the other hand, is interactive. It's usually some kind of interactive program embedded in the web page. Because it's interactive, dynamic content is potentially different each time you access it. A good example of dynamic content is a restaurant's web page that lets you build and order your own burrito online. Okay, that illustration gives you an idea of how your web browser interacts with web pages. Now let's take a closer look at the HTML code that web pages are written in. Here on the left, we have a simple web page. And over on the right, that's the source HTML code for this web page. That source code is what gets stored in the web server. Your web browser accesses that code, and it interprets and displays the code for you in a page resembling the one here on the left. For this particular web page, the first six lines of code are setup code that gives the browser information about the web page. There isn't much in these first six lines that's particularly important for us right now. I will briefly mention two things though. First, for this web page, the setup code is only six lines long, but for most professionally built web pages that you would interact with on a daily basis, there would be a lot more code than you see here. This is just an example. Second, I want to point out that the title of the web page is written between these two title tags here. Notice that the title is what is displayed in the tab on your web browser. Technically speaking, the title of a web page is this text that's displayed in the tab on your web browser. So, if you're ever trying to cite a web page for a paper, now you know where you can find the official title of a web page. Let's move down to the code contained between these two body tags. The code between these two tags defines what the bulk of the web page looks like. We can see a heading at the top of the web page that reads sample web page. And if we look over at the code, we see that the heading corresponds to the information between these H3 tags. Everything else on the web page is contained between a series of P tags. In web coding, P tags like this define paragraphs. A new P tag tells the browser to skip down a line and begin displaying a new paragraph of content. As we can see, each P tag here corresponds in order with another line of content over on the web page. Now, I want to show you two significant features of HTML that have security implications for you and me. The first is the difference between local images and remote images. You see, if you build a web page in HTML, one option is for you to upload your own images for the web page onto the same server where you're uploading all of the other HTML code. These are called local images. This first picture of a fish is a local image. The person who built this web page uploaded this image to the web himself or herself. However, HTML also has the ability to display images from other web pages in your web page. This isn't always legal, depending on how you use other people's images, but in principle, it's very easy to define a remote image from another web page as the image to be displayed on your web page. This second picture of a fish happens to be a remote image. Somebody else uploaded it to a different web page, but whoever built the web page that we're looking at has written the code so that it will take this image from somewhere else on the web and display it here. If you look over at the HTML code for this web page, you can see the web address where this picture is being hosted. If you are just looking at the web page, you can't tell whether an image is local or remote. You have to view the source code to make that distinction. So how is the distinction between local and remote images significant for cybersecurity? Well, some cyber criminals will build fake web pages that are intended to look like web pages from your bank or another trusted institution. They may use remote images from the trusted institution's web page to make their counterfeit web page look exactly like the original. 
you can't really tell that an image is from a remote source if you just look at the page itself, but if you learn some basics of HTML, it's not very difficult to check if a suspicious web page is relying on remote images like this one. All web browsers will allow you to view a web page's source code, so in theory, you could check for remote images on any web page. Let's look at one more feature of HTML that is relevant to cybersecurity. In HTML, it's extremely easy to lie about the destination of hyperlinks. Here, you can see the title of a hyperlink in black. That's the part that gets displayed on the web page. Over here in blue, you can see the actual web destination of each hyperlink. So this particular link is labeled dishonestly. It claims to navigate to CNN.com, but really it takes you to www.dougj.net. Criminal web pages and also scam emails will frequently contain misleading hyperlinks like this. They're designed to trick you into visiting malicious web pages that you wouldn't normally visit. The good news is that web browsers will tell you where a hyperlink really navigates to. All you have to do is hover the mouse button over the hyperlink without clicking on it. A small box should pop up somewhere on the browser window and it will tell you where the link will really take you. Okay, that's all for now. In the next lesson, we'll continue discussing security topics that are relevant to web browsing.